Hello and welcome to Stories of Scotland, a podcast about the wonderful history, heritage and nature of Scotland. Annie, you missed something. We are now an award-winning podcast. <laughs> of course, Jenny. <laughs> welcome to Stories of Scotland, an award-winning podcast. Yay! We are so, so pleased and totally in disbelief that we've been awarded a Literature Matters Award from the Royal Society of Literature. Jenny thinks that we're now royals and she's actually waving a crown. I have not taken it off since you cut my hair terribly in the garden. <laughs> <laughs> I think it really makes up for the, the mismatching lengths. <laughs> <laughs> sorry about that, Jenny. You're not sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no. But we're going to be using this Literature Matters Award to create an amazing new series with Stories of Scotland called Radical Mountain Woman. Yes, we are. And if you've enjoyed listening to us, Radical Mountain Women, then we're hoping you're really going to enjoy the stories of Radical Mountain Women times past that we're going to be bringing to you, hopefully soon. And back to this episode, where Jenny and I are going to be continuing our travels around the coasts of Scotland and looking into the history of one of the most magnificent castles in the whole country, Aelin Donnan. Yes. And Aelin Donnan is the epitome of all castles. After 20 years of restoration, in 1932, the castle is described in the London Illustrated News as being... The visitor, seeing Aelin Donan for the first time, might be pardoned for doubting whether the sight of any other castle or any part of the world would surpass in natural grandeur the rugged setting of this traditional stronghold of the Earls of Seaforth. It stands on a rocky islet amid the comparably grand scenery of Rosher. The storming of such a fortress must have presented heartbreaking difficulties to the clansmen of olden days, for the rock on which it is built is an island at high water. Access to the mainland is now provided by a bridge. Excellent. It is so beautiful. And we'll hear more about these heartbroken highlanders later. And not only is it a site of bloody conquest and stunningly photographic, it also has a deep history full of Vikings, Jacobite uprisings, and of course, ghosties. Amazing. Let's dive into this idyllic world of picturesque castles. But for anyone with burns, just a wee warning that this episode is a tad gory, so maybe listen to it first before you let them. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go. <laughs> The castle proudly stands on a small island at the meeting point of three lochs, Loch Duich, Loch Long and Loch Aosh. These lochs are surrounded by the stunning mountainous landscape of the northwest of Scotland. These raw mountains, like the lochs surrounding them, are the remnants of the last ice age which scoured the Scottish landscape to its very bones. Aelin Donan sits in this rugged terrain and makes it even more outstanding. It ties the lochs and the mountains together, protecting them from the Atlantic Ocean, which lies just to the west. And also the islands of the Inner Hebrides, most prominently Skye. In recent years, Skye has become a tourist hotspot in Scotland, with people travelling from all over the world to see the famous fairy pools and the stunning scenery. Skye truly is a wonderful island. If you're into long distance hiking, then the Sky Trail is a phenomenal way to see it. There are far fewer crowds and you gain a much clearer feel for island life, both present and past. Well, Jenny, maybe not the far past, because then we'd have to be watching out for the hordes of Viking raiders on that hike. Uh, well, yes, I have seen the locals get quite angry at all the tourist traffic and it really brings out the Viking blood in them. <laughs> Well, it's this Viking blood that led to the building of the first fortified structure on the small island of St. Donan, which we know as the Gaelic Aelin Donan. While there's evidence of a Pictish settlement dating back from the 6th century, the first defensive fort was built in the early 13th century to defend against Viking attacks. At this time, the Vikings were quite well established in different points of Scotland, because Vikings had been raiding and settling on Scottish islands since the 8th century. 
And so there were already established Celtic Norse clans on many of the inner and outer Hebrides islands. And it was these Viking clans which would try to not only raid the mainland, but also to conquer and capture the land itself. Yes, but Vikings were much more successful and comfortable on islands because they relied heavily on being surrounded by water for protection. Nevertheless, they would set sail into the Atlantic and into the opening of Loch Alsh in order to raid the lands of Kintail. Eilin Donan is in the perfect position to defend the Sea Kingdom's attacks. Although we aren't actually sure who built the first castle there. It could have been King Alexander II, or his son, King Alexander III, or Farquhar II, Earl of Ross. Yes, I read this too. It was built as an overband castle, so that's an extra checkpoint to defend from these bloodthirsty Vikings. Mm, no, no, Annie, that's, that's, I'm sorry, that's pretty wrong, actually, because I got really deep into this, and after some very detailed research, I think I've uncovered who it really was. Legend has it that if a newborn baby's first drink of water is from a raven's skull, then it will be bequeathed with supernatural powers. Now, it is said that a clan chieftain of Kintail did just this, giving his son Seamus his first drink from the skull of a raven. Now, Seamus grew up pretty normal. Pretty normal? He's just drunk from a raven's skull? Well, normal apart from the fact that he could talk to birds. Okay, that's a bit of a strange quirk. It is, it is. And one day his father and him sat in their great hall, and two ravens above cawed and cawed and cawed. Intrigued, his father asked him what the birds were saying. Seamus replied, I will not tell you, father. You'll no like it. His father persisted, and finally Seamus relented. "Ah, They say that one day you and I will be in this hall, but instead of me serving you, you will be serving me. Now his father panicked at the thought of his own son overthrowing him and in fear for his chiefdom, he banished his own son. Oh, that's dreadful. But it's surely the father's fault for giving Seamus the water in the first place. What did he expect? A son that would be really good at chess? (laughs) Well, Seamus was notoriously terrible at chess. However, in his exile, Seamus travelled far and wide using his skill of bird whispering to become a valiant war hero, for the birds would pass him tactics and secrets from behind enemy lines. Over time, he became mysterious and skilled as a warrior, and even improved his chess game a bit. And one dark and dreich stormy night, he returned to his father's hall, unaware that the strange guest was his own son. The father served a glass of wine as a welcome. Removing his hood, Seamus revealed himself to his father, and thus the prophecy was fulfilled. Ecstatic and overjoyed at the return of his son, he contacted the King of Scotland, who had already heard of the mysterious bird-whispering warrior, and as a reward for his aid in many conquests, he gave him the Isle of Donan, upon which he built Aelin Donan Castle. And that is fact. Um, so I really love this story because it's that kind of self-fulfilling prophecy that we see a lot in Scottish mythology and then it's also the idea that there's always a a kind of high price for magic. The father was going into the supernatural world to give his son powers that he himself didn't understand Mm. and then realises that his son has an almost uncontrollable power now. Yeah, I guess in a sense it's a sort of be careful what you wish for. But it's also a happy ending, so that's always a plus with a Scottish myth. Not always always the case, but when it is, it's nice. (laughs) (laughs) I'm really glad when it doesn't end with everyone dying. Nope, that's for the next section. Play the jingle. As we mentioned earlier, Elendonen is a site of some quite gruesome and grisly history mm. throughout all of its time. But we're going to start back in 1331. Ah, a good year for whiskey, I heard. And a better year for beheadings. Oh. So do you know about the first Earl of Murray? <laughs> of course I do, Annie. I have a Scottish history podcast. <laughs> <laughs> 
That would be Thomas Randolph, nephew of King Robert the Bruce. Robert was the king who fought for his right to the throne in William Wallace's revolt in the First War of the Scottish Independence, portrayed in films like Braveheart and Outlaw King. Thomas Randolph was so trusted by Robert the Bruce that he was made Guardian of Scotland. Indeed. Now, Thomas Randolph, the Earl of Murray, made an infamous visit to Aelendonan, and not just to view this scenic castle. We have a description of his visit by historian Agnes Marchbank, who's writing in 1901, which sums it up as... The Earl of Murray was very severe and strict in his manner of administering justice. He was a soldier to the fingertips, and one who meant to have his laws obeyed. The Earl of Murray seemed to have a special dislike of men who raided their own countrymen. Such these were not uncommon, and were dealt with very severely. Going to Aelendonan Castle in the Highlands to punish thieves, he executed and hung fifty of them around the tower. As he went down to the loch in a barge, he looked back at the lifeless bodies and said that he loved better to look on them than any garland of roses he had ever seen. It's pretty gory. So when I first read this, I was wondering where Agnes found such an in-depth account for an event that happened back in the 1300s, because this period in Scotland, especially in the north, is not very well documented at all. And the origin source really delighted me, Jenny. It's absolutely one of my favourite sources we've come across. Ooh, did you drink from the skull of a raven and have the, have the source bequeathed upon you in a dream? Almost. <laughs> so this is from the original Chronicle of Scotland, uh, attributed to Andrew of Winton. Now, it's written in Scots, and what's really exhilarating about this book is that it's an exceptionally early Scots document because it's written between 1383 and 1400. <laughs> so we are dealing with a book which is 600 years old here and it's written in Scots. Wow. Which is just incredible. Now, the original Chronicle of Scotland tells us about the Earl of Murray at Elendonan. Mm. And what's also marvellous about this source is it's written like all of the best 14th century history. In stone. In porridge. In interpretive Kaylee dance. Even better, Jenny. Wow. It's in rhyming couplets. <laughs> so, Jenny, I need you to do an award-winning performance of a 14th century Scottish canon. Thy mistures here and there, that in his rolls written were, all he got not but fifty, that fled where all witchly, as he outrun with meek pain, fleed the loch thy war all slain, and the heeds of them all were set up upon the wall. Um, okay, so I, uh, can we get a translation of that, please? Of course. Okay, so this poem is telling us that a lieutenant of the Earl of Murray has it written in his rules to deliver justice. <laughs> his morning rules. <laughs> By rules, they are meaning he has orders on a roll of parchment. Mm. Now, earlier on in this poem, it actually tells us that the Earl of Murray is planning a wee holiday to Elendonan. So he wants to ensure that the castle is prepared for his visit by executing all of the criminals, which is why he has sent his lieutenant up. Okay. So they're calling the criminals by the name of misdoers, which they mean to sound a bit more hard-hitting, something more like evildoers. Mm. And the poem tells us that these evildoers are boldly fleeing to Aelendonan but that the lieutenant overtook them with great pain to himself. Ah, Miko pain. Yes, they were fleeing the law, but they were captured and they were executed. And the heads of them were set up on the wall. Now it continues. Hey, on hecht on Aelin Donan, again that come o the warden, off that sicht he was recht blith, and till his court he had recht swith. And off the lave that entered where, justice he did evenly there, but him mistred noch to call. Them the flowers saw well that wall, 
for where they were knocked than fifty. He just grinned, bricked ugly. Oh, well done, Jenny. Considering that was written six hundred years ago, you did an absolutely sterling job. That was like a that was honestly like a six hundred year old tongue twister. <laughs> So this is telling us that the warden, the Earl of Murray, is looking at these heads, flowering the wall of Aelin Donnan, and he's feeling happy, joyous. Wow, and it ends with the heads grinning right ugly, which to me seems a little bit uh, tug-in-cheek, maybe? Not only did he kill them all, but then he calls them unattractive. Just, ooh, wow, couldn't, just, beheading them wasn't enough. One last insult to really just put the cherry on top of the 50 heads on stakes. So Aelin Donnan is also famous as a site of conflict during the 1719 Jacobite Rising. Ooh, yes, I read about this too. This is during the War of the Quadruple Alliance, when Spain went against Britain, France, the Holy Roman Empire and the Dutch Republic. Um, It's quite the party, and if I'm honest, quite one-sided. Yes, and Spain also propped up the exiled James Francis Edward Stuart. He's sometimes nicknamed the Old Pretender, and Spain was supporting his attempt to claim the British throne. So the name Jacobite actually comes from the Latin Jacobus, meaning James. And this is him, this is that James. So the Jacobite Risings are meaning to restore James of the House of Stuart, and then later his descendants to the British throne. And the takeover of Aelin Donan is such a brilliant story that kind of ties all this together. So the campaign was carefully planned by two Jacobite exiles, the Earl Marshal, also known as the Marquess of Tullibardine, and the Earl of Seaforth, the chief of the clan Mackenzie. So the two earls were meant to sail to the northwest Scottish coast with Spanish troops and then unite with the Jacobite rebels under Rob Roy and consolidate together to claim Inverness. Wow, the whole town of Inverness, that's quite the conquest. Ho ho! Not only was it the thriving metropolis of Inversnecki that they were after, but the plan was that as the Highland Rebellion was distracting London, the Duke of Vermont would land his Spanish ships on the southern shores of England encourage Jacobite sympathisers to join their brigade and then march over to London and claim the capital as well. Inverness was just a sneaky ruse to distract from the giant London goal. It was an eccentric and excellent plan. However, it didn't quite go to plan, did it, Jenny? Ah, no. They do not speak Scots in London currently, so (laughs) it did not. So both earls docked ships safely in Stornoway. They made it up there. But then they disagreed on who was to actually lead the mission. The classic sort of, I've got the bigger Earl argument. Now, this caused a delay which proved to be quite costly. It meant that intelligence of their whereabouts could be passed on to the British government before they were able to move. Once they decided, they did go and dock at Aelin Donan and meet up with the Scottish Jacobite troops, mostly Mackenzie's who were sworn to Seaforth, Macrae's, McKellen's, Murray's and McGregor's under outlaw hero Rob Roy, and more. They were very well armed, in fact too well armed, so they decided to store their extra gunpowder at Elendoran, with a garrison of about 50 Spanish soldiers. Right, so then they made their way to Inverness. And very quickly, right? Yes, as quick as they could get through the bogs and the mountains of the highlands. They needed to make an incredibly swift pace to keep up the element of surprise and claim Inverness as centre of their universe. However, the Jacobites had already delayed themselves, and so the news of their attack had already reached their enemies, who worked very quickly to foil the rebellious plans. Okay, this is quite an unfortunate Jacobite trait, that they they don't really adjust tactics to circumstance. Mm. These Jacobites have hearts of steel and courage of iron, but they aren't always the most strategic people when it comes to thinking and engaging in warfare. In this case, they had quite a good plan, but they aren't executing it very well at all. No, not well at all. It ended up that they were attacked from two sides. Firstly, the government sent five Royal Navy ships to guard the West Coast. Here, they quickly found the rebel Spaniards held up at Aelin 
So the Navy sent a small truce boat over to the island. Although the Spaniards fired at it and this really enraged the Navy. So their ships bombarded Aelin Donan with cannon fire. Oh, the poor castle. I can just see it crumbling now. Well, it was in quite severe disrepair at this point anywhere and it wasn't made to withstand a siege. Although it didn't crumble completely. It wasn't until the Spanish surrendered and the English troops then entered the castle that things really went south for it. They found the 52 barrels of gunpowder hidden in the keep and they used this to blow up the castle completely, leaving it nothing but a crumbling mass of rock. Unfortunately, that was only one side of the attack for the Jacobites. General Whitman had heard of the Inverness plot and was marching west to meet the insurgents to prevent them from taking the fine and grand town that we call home. They met the Jacobites at the Glen Shield Pass, which led to a battle that defeated the Jacobite uprising of 1719 in smoking heather and gunpowder. Quite the story, and at the heart of it all is Elendonan Castle. And the Jacobite disaster at Glen Shield really signified the end of this Jacobite uprising of 1719 and actually quite damaged the cause. Yes, it was one of the bullfights that the Spanish couldn't win, unfortunately, and the castle was left in just a paella of rubble. Oh, Jenny! (laughs) The castle lay in ruins for over 200 years, until Lieutenant Colonel John McRae Gilstrap, which is a fantastic name, bought the island in the early 1900s in order to rebuild the castle of his forebearers, and that he did. The current castle, the one in all the photos and calendars and shortbread tins, this is actually only about 100 years old. Yes, so Lieutenant Colonel McRae Gilstrap was not too focused on rebuilding the castle as it had once been in real life, but more how people imagined it had been. He was a visionary who really loved his clan and wanted to showcase it with this incredible castle. Mm. And along with Farquhar McRae, they designed the castle to be aesthetically beautiful. So it's perhaps a little bit more Edwardian chic than medieval practical. Mm. There's rumours that Farquhar had wildly vivid dreams in which he would see the castle as it had been hundreds of years prior in its kind of medieval glory and believing that these visions had been sent to him from his McRae ancestors, he insisted that the castle be built to the exact blueprint of his dream. And, I mean, they did a great job, but unfortunately, after reconstruction, plans for the old, old castle were actually found, and unfortunately for Farquhar, the new castle is a far cry from the original seven towers and defensive curtain walls that once stood. But its arched stone footbridge and tall, robust walls, rooftops and towers do seem to sit completely at home among the mountains and lochs of the west coast. So at least he didn't dream a big, bizarre, brutalist concrete fortress or something. He did do a good job with how it looked. I mean, they don't really have the original plans because it's not like they've got a map of a Pictish fort or anything. Very true. And it took the McRae's over 20 years for the reconstruction to be completed and cost the equivalent of around £10 million in today's money to do it. Now, it was finished in 1932 and it finally opened to the public in 1955. And since its completion, it has become a staple of the Scottish tourism industry. Hundreds of thousands of people visit each year snapping photos and immersing themselves in the rich and rugged history of the castle, clans and coastal warfare of the past. And maybe even catching a glimpse of one of the many ghosts that walk the passageways and great halls of the castle. Many claim to have seen the ghost of a mysterious woman, known only as Lady Mary, slipping between the walls and down the corridors of one of the towers. And it is said that a Spanish soldier who was decapitated by a cannon blast from the English onslaught spends his remaining time on earth still searching for his missing head in what is today used as the gift shop. Oh wow, that's unlikely that he'll find it. But also, would be an interesting fridge magnet. Yeah, really good fridge magnet, Um, but actually it's in the bargain basket because it's almost past its haunt by date. 
Oh, that's a dreadful, Jenny. It is. Okay. Yep. Well, Jenny, I think we can agree Aelin Donan is an absolutely wonderful castle. Absolutely. Now, I've found one last poem, which was written before the castle was restored. It's from a book called Moorland and Sea, written in 1894. Now the green ivy's tendrils clasp, the failing walls with friendly grasp, and harebells bloom and mosses cling, round the rude stones and over them fling. A veil that dims the earlier time, the bygone rule of force and crime, the good old days when might was law, and sword and chain held men in awe. Brilliant, Danny. Thank you so much. And thank you all for listening to Stories of Scotland from wherever you are in the world. We've really loved making this episode for you all. And if you enjoyed listening to it as much as we enjoyed making it, then please give us a like and a share and why not a wee review? We really hope you're doing well in these strange times that we've got. Slanjiva. Slanjiva. Slanjiva.